Dzień dobry Państwu. Witam na piątej edycji webinarów Wiedza ma warstwy prowadzonej przez Cygnis New Technologies. Bardzo miło, że Państwo się pojawili. Dziś będziemy rozmawiać na temat biotechnologii. Jutro porozmawiamy o przemyśle, a w środę, a w czwartek w zasadzie o nanotechnologii. Dziś naszymi gośćmi są dr Mehmet Denis Akius i inżynier aplikacyjna Karina Sobeczek z, ze strony Cygnis Biotechnologies. Żeby stało się zadość formalnością, ja robię tylko krótki wstęp, za chwilę przełączę się na język angielski, żeby opowiedzieć również po angielsku, co będzie się działo. Natomiast na początku zrobimy 10-15 minut prezentacji przedstawionej przez Karolinę, która opowie o Signis Biotechnologies i o tym, czym się zajmujemy, a następnie pałeczkę przejmie dr Mehmet, który opowie nam na temat dzisiejszego głównego tematu, o którym rozmawiamy, czyli bioinżynierii wyzwolonej. Dowiemy się co nieco o tworzeniu biomimetycznych mikrośrodowisk in vitro za pomocą modułu optycznego Primo firmy Alveol. Uh, okay, so uh, thank you all for coming. We are celebrating fifth edition of uh, Knowledge Has Layers webinars. Um, I hope you had great vacation, uh, all of you. And uh, we will start by uh, the short presentation by Karina Sobeczek, uh, application engineer in Cygnus Biotechnologies, uh, who will speak about our, our company and our portfolio. And uh, next, uh, the, uh, the, the microphone will be uh, given to Dr. Mehmet Denis Akius from Alveole. And uh, he will uh, speak about how to unleash bioengineering and he will also uh, say a few words about enabling researchers to engineer biomimetic in vitro microenvironments. A uh, whole uh, set of presentations will take around uh, one hour, and then uh, we'll have a Q&A session uh, in which you would, uh, you would have a chance to, to ask questions to our uh, speakers, and also, uh, if you would like, uh, raise your hand and um, and speak freely via uh, uh, camera and, and your microphone. Um, nie powiedziałem tego również Państwu. Jeśli uh, mają Państwo takie życzenie, po godzinie prezentacji łączonej uh, Karoliny uh, i uh, doktora Mehmeta, uh, mogą Państwo zadawać pytania, będzie sesja Q&A. Uh, mogą Państwo się do niej dostać w lewym rogu. Jest to drugi przycisk od góry. Klikając na niego możemy na samym dole wpisać wiadomość, którą, czy pytanie w zasadzie, które chcielibyśmy zadać naszym prelegentom, zarówno w języku polskim, jak i angielskim. Um, I te pytania odczytamy sobie po godzinie, e, kiedy nastąpi właśnie sesja Q&A. Mogą również Państwo podnieść rękę podczas tej sesji Q&A. Na samym dole mamy taką łapkę do podniesienia. E, możemy ją kliknąć e, i wtedy ja Państwu udostępnię kamerę i mikrofon, żeby Państwo bezpośrednio porozmawiali z którymś z prelegentów albo z obojgiem. W takim razie nie przedłużając, bo mamy już 12.10 prawie. Karolina, zapraszam. Dziękuję bardzo za wprowadzenie, Marek. Dzień dobry Państwu, cześć. Tak jak Marek powiedział, do mnie należy część przedstawienia grupy SEGNIS, czyli grupy składającej się z trzech pilarów, z trzech marek. SEGNIS Bio, SEGNIS New i SEGNIS Nano. Kim jesteśmy? Jesteśmy przede wszystkim ludźmi, zespołem, zespołem specjalistów, pasjonatów, projektantów, inżynierów, naukowców i specjalizujemy się we wdrażaniu innowacji hardware. Pracujemy w branży biotechnologicznej, w przemyśle i w nanotechnologii. Naszym miastem bazowym jest Warszawa. To tutaj mamy biuro na Grzybowskiej oraz produkcję R&D i serwis w gmachu radiochemii UW. Współpracujemy ściśle z uniwersytetem, jednak nie jesteśmy spin-offem, tylko oddzielną, niezależną firmą. A na co dzień można nas spotkać na tarasie prototypowania w Cambridge Innovation Center. Posiadamy własne laboratoria czyste ISO-7, laboratorium mikroskopowe oraz biodruku 3D, Opracowujemy technologię, budujemy maszyny oraz dostarczamy produkty końcowe. Posiadamy ponad 20 milionów złotych w szybkich ścieżkach, 
I oczywiście jesteśmy otwarci na dalsze współpracę i projekty. Mówią też o nas w mediach i tych tradycyjnych i w mediach społecznościowych. Tak jak powiedziałam, Cygnis, grupa Cygnis to trzy marki, czyli Cygnis New, zajmujący się przemysłem, budową maszyn specjalistycznych, szkoleniami, projektowaniem 3D, szybkim prototypowaniem. Cygnis Nano, zajmujący, doty, które dotyczy urządzeń um, zajmujących się ultrawysoką próżnią oraz Cygnis Bio. W Cygnis Bio współpracujemy z firmami, które należą do Bajko, z firmą Tissues, Izon, Fluigent, Nanolife, Solaris, z Ivio, z Oni oraz Alveol, o którym za chwilę Państwo usłyszycie. Zajmujemy się biodrukiem 3D, mikroskopią, hodowlami komórkowymi oraz narzędziami dotyczącymi nauk omicznych. Jeśli chodzi o biodruk 3D i modele tkankowe, posiadamy biodrukarki z jedną, trzema, sześcioma głowicami oraz takie biodrukarki, które mogą sieciować światłem UV. Hodowle tkankowe, czyli klasyczne bioreaktory, szeroka gama, do tego mikrobioreaktory, płytki do hodowli sferoidów oraz dalej narzędzia do analizy sferoidów, chipy mikrofluidyczne oraz różnego rodzaju systemy związane z mikrofluidyką, mikroskopia przeżyciowa, dwa główne mikroskopy. Jeden to jest Nanolife, czyli mikroskop holotomograficzny, który umożliwia super rozdzielcze obrazowanie przeżyciowe bez barwienia. Drugi to mikroskop skanujący do płytek, posiadający kontrast cyfrowy oraz trzy kanały fluorescencji. A jeśli chodzi o oprogramowanie, to bazujemy na oprogramowaniu AVIA, które można, jest niezależne od typu mikroskopu, bazuje na modułach sztucznej inteligencji i umożliwia um, analizę obrazów mikroskopowych 2D i 3D. Protokoły Sinusy, czyli praca z właściwie izolacja pojedynczych komórek. Dodatkowo płuczki mikropłytkowe i dyspensery nanolitrowe. To by było tyle z mojej strony szybkiego wprowadzenia i teraz zapraszam na naszą główną część prezentacji. Mehmet, are you ready? Yes, yes. Um, thank you, Karolina and Marek, for the introduction. It's a pleasure to be here and uh, participate in this webinar series. And I'm really looking forward to presenting the Primo technology and how we can help you to achieve your uh, biomimetic microenvironments uh, in your own lab. So I will start um, my presentation and share my screen now. Just let me know if it's working or not. And then we um, should be good to start. So I hope that you start seeing something now okay perfect um i will just get rid of these guys okay and uh, yeah we can start so thanks everyone for joining today um, my name is mehmet and i'm um, a business development and innovation manager at alveol and uh, today i will talk about um, our bioengineering platform um, the primo technology and I will show you um, a bit um, how it works um, and also give you examples of different applications from us, but also from our users that are actually act actively using the system um, in their own maps. Before I start going into the technical um, description, I would like to just have two slides about our company and the general vision. So at Alveol, um, actually um, we have um, three different sites. So our headquarters is based in Paris. Um, we have a research and development lab in Bordeaux, which is specialized a bit more in um, neuroscience. And we have also an office um, in US. And I am based in the German office in Cologne and responsible for uh, for the whole Europe um, and um, for innovation at the company. So um, Alveol is a French um, spin-off of three academic labs. You can see our founders um, below. Um, so they are experts in physics, bioengineering, and neuroscience. 
And um, with our first product, the Primo technology, we have actually already won uh, two awards. So the first one is the award for um, individualized medicine at 2014. And the second one is uh, the new product award in 2016. So the product as it is um, actually exists since uh, end of 2016. And now we have just uh, released the second uh, version of it, which is more efficient. So, um, and overall um, at Alveol, our goal is to, um, to engineer or generate tools to um, engineer micro environments. And uh, we have, um, actually we have a specific goal why we want to achieve this is because um, we know that for researchers, um, the in vitro systems are more, mostly easy to use, um, but they are not highly relevant in terms of physiology and uh, vice versa um, in vivo systems are more physiologically relevant but they are usually not so easy to use so at alveol we really want to concentrate on engineered micro environments and give the researchers the chance to engineer their own micro environments specific to their research question and today we can say that um, we can actually um, do that by changing the topography the chemistry and also the rheology of the microenvironment using our flagship product Primo. And this will really help you to generate a micro niche, a micro environment, which is um, more closer to the in vivo situation, but has still all the advantages of an in vitro system. So this is um, the Primo te um, technology that I've been talking about. Um, so this is actually the second version of the, of the Primo. And um, it's um, a contactless and a maskless uh, photo patterning um, technique. It's a UV-based device. And we have, in this case, virtual masks, which gives you a lot of uh, flexibility in terms of uh, different uh, achieving different shapes. Um, what you need to know uh, from a technical point of view is that the, the Primo, uh, the optical unit, the optical box, needs to be connected to an uh, inverted microscope. Um, we have a photo initiator, which is actually specifically activated um, by the UV that we have in our system. And the third and also as important component of the system is actually the software, which will enable you the projection of, of any image in grayscale onto your substrate. So if you would open the box and look inside, um, you would actually roughly uh, see that there is an LED light source. Um, which has a wavelength at 365 nanometers, a micro mirror device here, which will actually um, redirect the illumination uh, through the optical light path and lens tube um, onto your sample using the light path of the microscope. And um, basically uh, what, what happens is that uh, you need to um, upload a software to the software, a grayscale image, and the software can precisely control this micro mirror device that I've just mentioned. So it's a device that uh, consists of thousands of micro mirrors, which can be in an on or off stage. Uh, and if you have a white image or a gray image, it means that these mirrors will be on an on stage. So all the UV coming from the LED will be redirected to your sample. And if it's a black area on, in the image, or it's, if it's a black image, then all these micro mirrors will be uh, in an off stage uh, according to the shape that you upload to the software. It means that uh, you can actually uh, really control precisely um, up to a mic one micron resolution the illumination pattern on your cells. And why do we actually want to do that? There is, a, um, there is a simple reason, because we would like to generate um, actually either microstructures on our substrates, or we would like to functionalize a surface. So this is just an example of, of a simple pattern here on top, um, a, a grayscale or black and white image that you would upload to your software. And then um, depending on the application, you can actually choose to structure your um, substrate, to functionalize your substrate, or to do both at the same time. So you can first generate a 3D structure using this technique and then uh, functionalize the structure with proteins or other biomolecules to make it more attractive to cells. Um, 
I will talk briefly about the workflow and how this can actually be achieved in, in practice and then um, move to the applications. And I, I think at that point, it will be clearer to you uh, what could be done with this system. So um, the classical workflow for micro patterning of proteins, which is one of the main applications of this uh, system, uh, starts with a classical cell substrate. So this is a substrate that can be um, used in cell culture. The, everything that you can use in cell culture is compatible with our um, system. The first step is always to add a layer of antifoiling coating to prevent the binding of any cells or any um, biomolecules onto the substrate. So you first block your substrate with this PEG layer. Usually it's PEG-based chemistry, which can be commercially available. Um, we can also provide this chemistry to you. And then um, the second, the third step is actually to add the photo initiator that we also provide, which can be activated by the UV light that we have in our optical device. The fourth step is to load an image of interest, which will represent the pattern that you want to generate at the end on your substrate in grayscale or black and white. And um, then you can actually start already the illumination using our software. You basically have to just push uh, play and then uh, the corresponding pixels, uh, the corresponding white pixels on your, subs on your image will be illuminated onto your substrate. And this photo initiator that you added in solution and step three is actually active only in presence of UV. And um, what it does is really a, a photo station mechanism to cut this peg layer that you added on the second step and uh, free up some space for biomolecules and also cells to attach. When you do that, um, usually you have some washing steps in between and um, you can actually then add your protein of interest or your biomolecule of interest and the cells at the final step will actually recognize this um, patterns and they can only bind to these areas because everything else is still blocked by this peg chain. So uh, if, if you look a bit broader on, on both main applications, patterning versus structuration, uh, the, the workflow is actually similar, but for the structuration part, uh, the difference is that here, instead of um, starting with the normal substrate, you start with the um, photoresist that you would like to shape using our UV source. Um, so in this case, it can be a classical microfabrication using, uh, for example, SU8 or it could be uh, other photoresins or hydrogels which are sensitive to UV and we can be cross-linked or polymerized using UV. Again, you upload your um, image to the software on step two, uh, you illuminate, and uh, this um, induces uh, a polymerization or cross-linking linking reaction, and then you can generate in step four on the left side um, your photoresist master, which can then be used um, to deposit any substrate of interest uh, to generate your final 3D uh, structure or 3D chip. And usually um, PDMS is widely used to do that, but we also have users that are actually testing other, um, other uh, resins and other um, substrates which are more compatible with their cells and applications. So for the functionalization, if you would like to now have this chip and functionalize it, the workflow is exactly the same as uh, the micro patterning workflow. You add your photo initiator, you illuminate the areas that you would like to uh, pattern with proteins. And then you, again, at the final step, you can add your um, cells onto these structures and they will only bind to the patterned areas. So a, a few words about the performance. So uh, what makes the Primo system really um, strong um, in the micro patterning and structuration field is that you can actually pattern multiple proteins. Since it's a digital system, um, you can actually upload one, one pattern. Um, you see on the left an example of, of multi-protein patterns, uh, here in this case, uh, green fibrinogen and protein A in red. Um, and the workflow will be quite, quite the same. So you will pattern your first protein by uploading the image, aligning to an existing 3D structure or to the area where you would like to pattern. You finish your patterning of the first protein and then you can sequentially just repeat the same steps to pattern a second or even third protein. 
So um, it is quite uh, quite important to have multiple cues sometimes for, for different um, uh, experiments. Then, since we can control each micromirror on the DMD device, you can control the UV dose for each pixel of illumination in on your substrate. This can be done by uh, directly playing with the dose of the UV or by adjusting the grayscale level uh, of your initial image that you send to the software. And when you do that, actually, you can generate gradients of proteins or different concentrations of the same protein on the same substrate, which is also quite important because we know that certain cell types actually can be attracted uh, by a certain concentration of proteins. And uh, if the concentration is, for example, higher, this can be toxic or repulsive for the for the same cell type. So it's really important to be to have this precise control of protein quantity on the substrate. I mentioned also in the beginning that it is compatible with multiple substrates. So everything that you would think about using in your cell culture will be compatible with this uh, technique. And you can achieve a resolution around 1.5 micrometers in 2D and around 2 micrometers in 3D experiments um, with this technique. So just an overview about the fields of applications. I will go into detail on each um, in the next slides. Um, I think this will be more interesting now for you. So um, basically, the first applications that we started with were really simple micro patterning experiments for the mechanobiology field. And in this case, they really want to control the shape uh, of, of a single cell or multiple cells so that they can address different questions like um, how does the cytosplatin reorganize if a cell has a certain shape, what kind of different uh, factors are influencing this reorganization and so on. So really to give you more standard way of looking at your own cell types. And then actually researchers started to combine these techniques with uh, different um, applications. So we, we will see how you can use this technique to do force measurement, to study cell migration. But also if you move to the structuration and 3D part, how it can actually be used to achieve 3D confinement of cells to form spheroids or organoids, and even to, to manipulate hydrogels to generate 3D um, biocompatible substrates. And finally, I will also mention uh, the classical microfabrication um, that, that can also be done using this system. So to start with the protein um, patterning part, as I said, usually this is mostly the interest of, of researchers that really would like to have a standardized cell model, cell shape, so that they can further analyze a different phenomena in the, in the cell. Just to give you an example, on the left upper side, you see a single cell that is patterned into two different shapes. So on the left, there is this Pac-Man shape. On the right, there is this um, half circle with different uh, stripes. And um, this is actually a good example of how the shape can actually influence the structure in the cell. Um, on the left, uh, you see that in green, uh, you can see the integrins, uh, which are corresponding to the focal additions, and the actin, which is responding, uh, corresponding to the um, cytoskeleton. And on the right hand, you see that uh, actually the number of focal additions really changes depending on the shape of the cells, so depending on the pattern that you apply. And this gives you really a great tool to study these kind of events and uh, really to identify um, identifiers um, and, and influencers to these kind of rearrangements within the cells. And then you can, of course, combine it with different techniques and study uh, in super resolution, really the architecture of a cell. And um, since you will have hundreds or thousands of cells which are looking exactly the same on the substrate, it will really give you a, a significant readout. Uh, you could um, also pattern different ligands and, and see how this really changes the behavior of the cell. Um, and uh, finally, uh, of course, you don't have to do that all in single cell level. level. You can actually project much larger images to the substrate and study cell populations, but also larger cell cultures, as you see on the right bottom. Um, Speaking about larger cell populations, actually, um, part of our community, uh, they are using this system to do high content screening experiments. So on the left side, you actually see uh, visualization of the patterns on the, on the multi-well plates. 
Um, in this case, it's RPE1 cells, which are stained for actin. And um, these kind of experiments are actually quite interesting for researchers which are, for example, working on stem cells. They want to investigate how a certain shape really affects the differentiation towards the lineage. And um, in this case, actually, they can do this by doing this high content imaging and screening applications. And our technique is uh, compatible with these, tech, uh, with these other technologies. So it gives you really a, a good readout to study uh, these kind of effects of, of differentiation in stem cells. Um, so I also mentioned in the beginning that um, the system is contactless, uh, which also gives you an advantage, especially if you're interested in working in soft, soft substrates. Um, um, any other technique to generate micro patterns would actually um, either destroy the substrate because it will be contact based or it will be quite slow, uh, especially so for example, if you use techniques like laser scanning. In this case, I, I will show you this example of, of um, smooth muscle, muscle cells, which are actually patterned on a soft gel. So here you see the stiffness. Uh, so this is 0 0.3 kilopascal. It's really soft. And then we go towards stiffer substrates. And in all um, different stiffness, you can achieve the same uh, micro patterning result. And in this case, actually, the researchers are in, um, interested um, in how the stiffness um, of the substrate can actually influence the force transduction between different cells. And to do that, they have embedded fluorescent speeds into these uh, soft gels before the experiment, and they look at the translocation of these beads um, depending on the stiffness of the substrate. And since you have, again, hundreds or thousands of the same cells, it gives you really a good readout in the end to have a statistical uh, result. Um, some other scientists, they actually um, use this uh, technology to mature their cells. Um, it is known that micropatterning or the structure of a, of a cell has actually um, an impact on the maturity, especially for cardiomyocytes. Um, it, is, it is known and there's, there are many publications that um, micro patterning actually helps the cells to mature. So um, in this case, um, the scientists are looking at uh, cardiomyocytes derived from human induced pluripotent stem cells and they are coated on um, laminin patterns in different shapes. And then you can actually see how the nucleus, sarcomeres, and the junctions are rearranged depending on the pattern. And then there is uh, the next step, the physiological readout, which is more to look at, at the beating properties, for example, of these cells. And uh, since you can do or achieve these mature cells, even in smaller numbers, um, you don't need to actually use too many cells to look at this phenomenon and you can already identify important factors that have an influence in this maturity. So um, other researchers, they also are interested, of course, in migration as we can control the quantity of proteins and we can also add multiple proteins. Um, it is, of course, very logical that um, the scientists want to use this system to have migration assays. So in this case, uh, this is an example from our users in Geneva. And they have MDCK cells, which are patterned into different um, shapes. So this is an example of the pattern that you would have on your um, substrate. Sorry. Fast here. OK. So this is an example of the patterns that you would project um, to the sample. So full white means that uh, during the time of illumination, all micromirrors corresponding to these full white units will be um, in an on stage. So they will redirect the UV light directly to the sample. Uh, it means that you will have then more proteins later on on these full white areas. And then there are also these gray areas, which are then uh, which will have less protein concentration and the black areas which will not have any protein concentration. So you can see then when you see it yourselves how they actually behave on these different concentrations. So in this case on the left, the cells prefer to stay in this full white, so highly protein concentrated areas. And on the right, there is a gradient in the end 
And here you see that the cells actually start to move towards the gradient, but at this point, the concentration is not high enough to move towards this direction. So they also prefer the higher concentration of uh, fibronectin in this case. Since it's a contactless technique, um, you can, of course, now think about doing these kind of migration ex experiments also in closed uh, environments. So uh, let's take this um, microfluidic chip. Um, in this case, uh, the researchers are actually interested in the migration of immune cells, more specifically lymphocytes, and um, they would like to assess actually uh, what are the different factors that influence the activation of the lymphocytes. So you can really generate a smart uh, cell-based assay by patterning different molecules, known or unknown, to really investigate how this directly affects the migration and the activation of a single cell or multiple cells. So in this case, um, this is a microfluidic channel. And on the, on the left part of the channel, um, the, the researchers have patterned fibronectin, and on the right side, they have actually patterned an antibody, a CD3 antibody, which is known to activate uh, the lymphocytes. So you see that the cell actually, uh, this is the, the migratory zone, uh, which you can follow by looking at the um, nucleus movement. So you can see that the nucleus actually moves over time um, in the fibronectin uh, patterns area without any issues, and then uh, once it starts getting to this um, CD3 antibody patent area, it actually stops uh, why? because it's activated. So giving you really this kind of possibility to have um, um, these cell-based assays to investigate different or unknown molecules and what they do actually um, in terms of migration on your cell types. We also have uh, we are heavily involved in neurobiology as our research lab is also working on, on neuroscience, but also so, uh, some of our users actually they are interested in uh, gen having uh, axonal guidance experiments with different cues or to generate neuronal networks to investigate synapse formation, for example. So this is just one example. Uh, you can see the gr patterned grids with laminin and we are trying to actually force the axons to migrate in these um, grids to form uh, precise connections between each other. So these are hippocampal neurons. And you see that over time, actually, they uh, the axons, they have to connect to each other using these grids. So it's also, again, a smart way to generate an organ-on-a-chip approach in 2D or to induce a specific uh, cellular events such as synapse formation in a more uh, controlled manner. I know, um, let's say, 2D application that I would like to focus on today is actually um, related to electron microscopy. So um, this is this has been actually really uh, a focus um, in the last years uh, for um, a lot of our customers who are working in electron microscopy. And if you are, if you know a bit about the field um, in electron microscopy copy, you have the problem that in the classical workflow you have, uh, you, you need to use these uh, grids to, um, to attach your cells and then to do the further uh, cryo-EM analysis. But if you just use the grids as they are, the cells, they, they just um, randomly spread on the grids. And there, it's really difficult to find the right cell correctly positioned in the grid so that, can, that it can be further analyzed in the um, um, EM, uh, correlative EM applications. Uh, so to, to solve this issue, actually, we have introduced the micro patterning on these grids. And um, this is actually tremendously increasing the number of e events that can be analyzed in one grid. So it increases a lot the efficiency of the experiment. And the scientists are now actually sure that they will have exactly the size, the shape, the location of the cell that they need to have to do this further correlative microscopy and fibrinning uh, cryo-ET uh, workflow. Just one example here um, that you can actually really nicely control also the shape uh, of your cells on, on these kind of grids, which are made of different substrates, such as gold, carbon, uh, silicium oxide. So we are really compatible with different types of substrates in this case as well. And uh, this is really increasing the 
the efficiency of these kind of experiments. So now I will move a bit on the 3D part. So this is more the 3D protein patterning. And um, so it could be that you already have an existing 3D structure like a microfluidic chip or PDMS pillars that you would like to now um, make more attractive for cells or you would like to control on these structures where the cells actually attach. In this case, uh, Primo is actually quite useful. So you just repeat uh, the same workflow that we have. Um, in this case, uh, just to add the photo initiator, illuminate, degrade the, the pack layer, add proteins, and then add cells. And when you do that, actually, you can really control the cell adhesion also in 3D. Um, so on the left, there is an example of PDMS micropillars, which are in uh, 100 meter height, uh, 100 micrometer height, and they are patterned with two different biomolecules. So you see the red and the green and um, the cells can only bind to, to these areas um, which are patterned. In the middle, there is the micro well, which is generated by uh, using Primo and uh, UV sensitive material. Um, so in this case, um, we have patterned the bottom with PSA and, and the side walls of the well with fibronectin. And uh, so since we have a certain field of depth where the laser is efficient, you can actually also pattern um, the side walls of an existing structure. Let's say you have a pillar or a micro well, you can actually now think about um, patterning the site as well in 3D. And um, finally, this is an, another example uh, from a lab in um, Singapore. So they are actually interested in um, bile duct formation. And in this case, they have this, um, this chip um, and they would like to precisely control the distance of uh, individual cells and, and really understand better what is the minimum distance required to start forming a bile duct between hepatocytes. So you have, again, um, the patterns that you see on the side walls, so you can nicely space your individual cells, in this case, it's hepatocytes, and then you can also make this uh, make them come closer or a bit more, for di more distant to really understand this minimum distance that is required to generate a, a cellular event. So 3D patterning is also quite useful, especially if you would like to generate 3D structures afterwards. So steroid formation is actually uh, one of these experiments which are quite hot at this, at this point in, in our um, community. And um, usually they are generating these through hole micro valves using our system. So through hole means that there is nothing at the bottom. So it's really uh, more efficient to image them afterwards. And uh, when you do, when you generate these kind of through hole micro valves and functionalize the bottom with the protein, you can actually nicely generate these spheroids uh, over time. I will show you in a later example that you can make these walls also a bit higher so that you can keep them and grow them much larger than this. So uh, next are the hydrogel applications. And um, this is really then going towards 3D and generating 3D structures using the Primo system. So um, in this case, uh, the only thing that you would actually need to be careful about is to use a hydrogel that is UV sensitive or take a hydrogel and make it UV sensitive um, by adding some, uh, some other chemicals like um, um, for example, you can add uh, polyacrylamide a little bit to the mixture so that it's, uh, it can be cross-linked with UV. So in this case, um, this is work from our um, former PhD student uh, who has now finished. Um, you will see an example of hydrogel structuration and functionalization for cells. So in the first step, you actually have, um, you actually have, uh, sorry. One second. No, it's back. So we have first the structuration part of the hydrogel. Um, so below you see the pattern that we generate. So there is a kind of a gradient towards the, um, the edges of these circles. Um, and it means that on these edges, there will be less UV light, basically illuminated to the sample. 
Um, and what that actually means in, ter in terms of 3D structuration is that uh, when you go up in this um, illumination pattern, since there is less UV, there is less polymerization or cross-linking of the substrate. So you can actually generate these kind of nice uh, arbitrary shapes. In this case, it's more like a dome shape structure. And then um, when you generate these structures, at the second step, you can actually decorate them with proteins so that you make them attractive for cells. Um, so here we have an example of the decoration part. So in, in red, we actually just add a protein which can be um, linked to the hydrogel um, and it is uh, attractive for the cells. And when you do that, so this is a 3D view now, uh, we are going um, up from the patterns so there are no there is no attachment up to the patterns and when you see the patterns and afterwards you can see that the cells actually nicely attach i'm sorry about this <laughs> video issues um with, uh, uh. okay so towards the end you see that uh, there is really this nice structure uh, in 3d uh, on these domes, so you actually now control um, the topography and the biochemical properties and decide where your cells can actually attach on the 3D structure. Another example is actually to modify or to generate structures within closed environments in 3D. So in this case, um, I will show you this example um, from a lab based in, in France. So they are actually working on commercially available micro uh, fluidic chips but they would like to generate additional structures on these chips to to have like a bit more um, different approach to sometimes to have um, a multi-cellular or multi-cell type approach on the same chip um, in that case they are actually interested in generating a hydrogel membrane inside the chip in this area um, so to do that, they are actually um, add within the chip um, PEG-DA uh, hydrogels, which are UV sensitive. And when they do that, um, you can see here um, also nicely the software and how you can align the structures. You can really easily um, cross-link um, your substrate. So you see even in bright field that the substrate is cross-linked. And then you can choose a different shape or different pattern. You move it because we have full control on the stage and camera uh, and then you can precisely position it on the next step to to make it really more um, let's say efficient and then to close this membrane there is i think one final step um, to to pattern on this part yes now it's coming it's a bit slow Within seconds, you can actually modify or generate structures within your microfluidic chips. And this was the example I, I mentioned before. So if you would make these um, micro wells a bit larger and, um, and, and higher, then of course you can keep your spheroids longer in these wells. And, and this is really good if you want to be, if you want to be sure that all your spheroids have the same size, same shape, and uh, size and shape do not influence um, the research question that you're about to ask. In most cases, um, um, our customers, they are actually adding different drugs or different molecules to see how this influences the spheroid and organoid development. They look at uh, events like um, apoptosis or proliferation or differentiation afterwards by um, doing stainings. Um, so it's it's actually Again, a really nice tool to, to generate these kind of cell-based assays. And just to give you an example that we can work with multiple substrates and multiple um, photosensitive materials. Uh, these are just a few examples from the paper that was published um, from our PhD student. But uh, just, just for you to know that uh, in principle, every material that can be used um, in cell culture can be possibly made UV sensitive, even if it's not UV sensitive by nature. So here you have on the left, uh, PEG acrylate, in this case, polyacrylamide, but also you could think about using uh, substrates like 
agar or matrigel, which are usually not uh, UV sensitive. And the last um, part is actually about the microfabrication process itself. So in this case, I mentioned in the beginning that what you just need to um, make sure is that you use a photoresist, which is UV sensitive. The most commonly used photoresist is actually SU8, and it is, of course, UV sensitive. So we are not really changing the workflow of, of microfabrication in this case, but we just make it more flexible and efficient, especially for prototyping experiments. If you would use a classical approach with a physical mask and, and a UV source, you are definitely not going to be very flexible in, in terms of production. Uh, so each time you need to change slightly the, the shape, you would actually need to order a new physical mask or produce one. And in this case, within a very short time, you can actually check uh, or investigate different shapes and then um, decide which one is actually the right one for your for your experiment. And after that, uh, when you when you um, have your master, you can of course deposit your structure of interest or your substrate of interest, which is more compatible with your uh, setting. So this is just one example about PDMS micro pillars that we have generated uh, in house. Actually, so they are five micrometers spaced by five micrometer um, pillars. Usually, um, we have some customers that are actually patterning on top of these pillars. They attach the cells on the pillars, and then they do some kind of interaction or force transduction studies by looking um, at the displacement of the pillars itself. So it's, it's again, very interesting to do that. And we also have other users that um, take this classical microfabrication approach and replace the initial part uh, by using our system uh, to be more flexible. And in that case, they are really interested in generating uh, full microfluidic chips. Um, so how that would look like if you want to do that with Primo, um, this is just one example. So usually these chips are quite large and they are actually um, um, they need to be fully functional, of course, so there can no, not be any interruptions. And the way we pro project images uh, onto the sample is actually in smaller field of views. So this is why I wanted to show you this slide. Um, and it, it is very important that um, you have to be able to control uh, the stage in this case and to do a stitching experiment so that you actually have the full structure in the end. So these uh, red squares will be on one field of view in this case, and then uh, just focus on these transitions between the different field of views. And you will see that the transition is actually perfect and the chips are really functional. And this is because we have developed a certain algorithm in our software so that this, um, this border areas are actually, um, there is a compensation for the, for the structure and for the illumination so that it's really smooth in the end. And like this, you can actually generate a full PDMS chip um, in a very short time. I mean, the best we had, I think, at the customer sites was um, below four hours, including all baking steps. And this is actually the final um, slide about, about the presentation and about microfabrication. Um, it's just to, to maybe stimulate a discussion later on. Uh, so, of course, you can use these classical um, photoresists, but there are also many photoresists that are still in research. Some are also uh, commercially available, which are actually, um, which, which have a differential um, response to UV. So, in this case, um, if they are more or less sensitive, this will give you um, the advantage to test and to use different UV doses with our system. And, and like this, you can actually generate um, arbitrary structures which are more similar to the in vivo situation. So in this case, just to give you an example, uh, on the left upper side, you see the different patterns that we project um, to, the, to the photoresist. And then on the right, you actually see the topology that is generated. So here we have uh, a gradient uh, from the middle to the end. And you see that you can generate a dome-like structure. Then you can generate some stairs here. Or if you have a gradient, you have a bit more continuous, um, let's say, um, ramp. And in this case, it's just full wide image. So you can actually generate a higher structure by using these uh, the differentially sensitive 
uh, photoresist. So with this, I would like to end my presentation and um, I hope it was, um, it was interesting for you and I'm looking forward to the discussion and to the different questions that you may have. Great, great. Thank you. Thank you, Mehmet. Uh, that was really great uh, uh, for me. Uh, uh, it was very informative uh, also. So uh, thank you once again. Uh, please, uh, if you have any questions, uh, please ask them at the Q&A panel on the left side. Jeśli macie jakiekolwiek państwo pytania, prosimy je zadawać po lewej stronie. Już mamy pierwsze pytanie. We have a first question. Uh, right now, how deep uh, wells, high walls, can we create in a pattern? What is the limitation of dim dimensions? So it's a really good question, and um, so I, I guess it, it it's referring to the microfabrication part and the height of the structures that we can uh, generate. So since we use the microscope, let's say to to scale down the image and to to, um, to pattern the substrates, it also depends a bit on which objective is used. So with the 20x, which is the one that we usually recommend, um, you can generate structures up to uh, 100, 150 uh, micrometers. And then if you would, if you're interested in higher structures, um, you should definitely use the 4x. In this case, the field of depth is around, I mean, in principle is around one millimeter, but uh, usually um yeah around uh, 500 to 800 micrometers is actually fine to generate a straight um, let's say wall around the structures okay thank you um if you have any additional questions we'll wait just uh, just a minute uh if there would be a situation where the the best questions always come up like 10 minutes after the debate. Uh, so if you'd have uh, any questions later, uh, please send them to uh, via email uh, to, for example, our application engineer, Karolina Sobeczek. Uh, she will answer them directly or contact you with Dr. Mehmet. Uh, but I have also one question. Mm. Sure. So uh, if you would tell me what, what is the uh, what was the most interesting application that you've seen of your uh, Primo systems? Uh, maybe the one that you really like, maybe the research or publication that was outstanding for you personally. Mm -hmm. So um, so as an innovation manager, of course, I also always discuss scientific projects with the customers or apply to, to mutual grants, which is actually something that we really like to do. And uh, so there, of course, many applications that are really interesting, but um, what I find more striking is actually the fact that you can really induce maturation of, of these cardiomyocytes using patterns. And, and this has a great impact on drug screening. So um, a lot of our customers are now really focused in this area. And, and this is really in terms of physiological relevance and how micro patterning can influence this. This is really fascinating to me. And uh, also a really um, straightforward application is this electron microscopy application, which really improves the workflow a lot. I mean, um, scientists have reduced their time to obtain um, these amenable cells on their grids uh, at least 10 times. I mean, this has been published a lot recently so and these two examples are really showing me the value of uh, of, of micro patterning and microstructuration and how it can impact and accelerate your research but the good news is that um, in each lab we, we put the system you always have a new application so it's always uh, interesting actually what other scientists come up with and uh, yeah I, I hope that in, in Poland also we will have uh, these kind of really interesting applications uh, in the future. So it drives uh, research, it drives innovation, drives the, the growth. Exactly. Uh, so we, we give you this, this tool which can do many things and then the, the scientists actually decide what, what they need to do with it usually. So these are just simple examples of, of how it's used, but it doesn't mean that the use is really restricted to these applications, which is the good thing. Yeah. 
Great. Okay. Uh, thank you. So, uh, jeśli mają Państwo jeszcze jakieś pytania, uh, może przerzucę się na polski tym razem, uh, prosimy zadawać w sekcji Q&A. Um, Zaczekamy jeszcze minutkę, dwie. Uh, jeśli nie, no to tak jak została umieszczona informacja, do Państwa uh, można zadawać uh, pytania naszej application engineer, inżynier aplikacyjnej, uh, Karolinie Sobeczek. Uh, nie ma problemu, tutaj odpowiemy również po webinarze. Cały webinar natomiast był i jest nagrywany, także będzie do odtworzenia, będzie do odsłuchania, umieszczony również na naszym kanale społecznościowym w serwisie YouTube. Tak i będzie można sobie później odświeżyć niektóre informacje. OK, so what I haven't told you is that whole meeting was recorded and it will be Uh, sent not only to uh, to Mehmet, um, but also it will be available on our social media channels on uh, on YouTube. So uh, if you would have any uh, any need to refresh the knowledge, uh, it is there. Great. So I don't see any more questions, and I guess we can getting we we can get close to an end. Uh, so, Mehmet, thank you once again. It was really great, and uh, and thank you, Karolina, also, who's uh, uh, somewhere there. Yes, thank <laughs> you. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much for this opportunity, uh, Marek, Karolina, and uh, Anna as well. So um, it was really a pleasure. And if you have more questions, Karolina and I would be really happy also to answer them later. As you said, Mark, the best questions come after the presentations. Yeah, <laughs> of course. Best re responses and uh, stuff like that also. So, yeah, that's a shame, but <laughs> you can contact us uh, uh, at all times. Okay, so uh, just to give an introduction for tomorrow's webinar, we will talk about resins and uh, DevOS systems uh, for 3D printing from resin. But more on that tomorrow. Uh, as always, 12 a.m. Um, so thank you once again. It was a pleasure. And goodbye. Bye.